It's milk and biscuits time. When Aladdin found himself so handsomely equipped, he returned his uncle thanks, who thus addressed him, As you are soon to be a merchant, it is proper you should frequent these shops and be acquainted with them. He then showed him the largest and finest mosques, carried him to the khans or inns where the merchants and travellers lodged, and afterward to the sultan's palace where he had free access, and at last brought him to his own khan, where, meeting with some merchants he had become acquainted with since his arrival, he gave them a treat to make them and his pretended nephew acquainted. This entertainment lasted till night, when Aladdin would have taken leave of his uncle to go home. The magician would not let him go by himself, but conducted him to his mother, who, as soon as she saw him so well dressed, was transported with joy and bestowed a thousand blessings upon the magician. Early the next morning, the magician called again for Aladdin and said he would take him to spend that day in the country, and on the next he would purchase the shop. He then led him out at one of the gates of the city to some magnificent palaces, to each of which belonged beautiful gardens, into which anybody might enter. At every building he came to, he asked Aladdin if he did not think it fine, and the youth was ready to answer when anyone presented itself, crying out, Here is a finer house, uncle, than any we have yet seen. By this artifice, the cunning magician led Aladdin some way into the country, and as he meant to carry him further, to execute his design, he took an opportunity to sit down in one of the gardens, on the brink of a fountain of clear water, which discharged itself by a lion's mouth of bronze into a basin, pretending to be tired. Come, nephew, said he, you must be weary as well as I. Let us rest ourselves, and we shall be better able to pursue our walk. The magician next pulled from his girdle a handkerchief with cakes and fruit, and during this short repast he exhorted his nephew to leave off bad company, and to seek that of wise and prudent men, to improve by their conversation. For, said he, you will soon be at man's estate, and you cannot too early begin to imitate their example. When they had eaten as much as they liked, they got up and pursued their walk through gardens separated from one another, only by small ditches, which marked out the limits without interrupting the communication, so great was the confidence the inhabitants reposed in each other. By this means, the African magician drew Aladdin insensibly beyond the gardens, and crossed the country till they nearly reached the mountains. At last, they arrived between two mountains of moderate height and equal size, divided by a narrow valley, which was the place where the magician intended to execute the design that had brought him from Africa to China. We will go no further now, said he to Aladdin. I will show you here some extraordinary things, which, when you have seen, you will thank me for. But while I strike a light, gather up all the loose dry sticks you can see to kindle a fire with. Aladdin found so many dried sticks that he soon collected a great heap. The magician presently set them on fire, and when they were in a blaze, threw in some incense, pronouncing several magical words which Aladdin did not understand. He had scarcely done so when the earth opened just before the magician, and discovered a stone with a brass ring fixed in it. Aladdin was so frightened that he would have run away, but the magician caught hold of him, and gave him such a box on the ear that he knocked him down. Aladdin got up trembling, and, with tears in his eyes, said to the magician, "'What have I done, uncle, to be treated in this severe manner?' "'I am your uncle,' answered the magician. "'I supply the place of your father, and you ought to make no reply. "'But, child,' added he, softening, "'do not be afraid, for I shall not ask anything of you, "'but that you obey me punctually, "'if you would reap the advantages which I intend you. "'Know, then, that under this stone there is hidden a treasure, "'destined to be yours, and which will make you richer than the greatest monarch in the world. No person but yourself is permitted to lift this stone or enter the cave, so you must punctually execute what I may command, for it is a matter of great consequence, both to you and me. Aladdin, amazed at all he saw and heard, forgot what was past, and rising said, Well, uncle, what is to be done? Command me, I am ready to obey. I am overjoyed, child, said the African magician, embracing him. Take hold of the ring, 
and lift up that stone. Indeed, uncle, replied Aladdin. I am not strong enough. You must help me. You have no occasion for my assistance, answered the magician. If I help you, we shall be able to do nothing. Take hold of the ring and lift it up. You will find it will come easily. Aladdin did as the magician bade him, raised the stone with ease and laid it on one side. When the stone was pulled up, there appeared a staircase about three or four feet deep leading to a door. Descend, my son, said the African magician. Those steps and open that door. It will lead you into a palace divided into three great halls. In each of these, you will see four large brass cisterns placed on each side, full of gold and silver. But take care you do not meddle with them. Before you enter the first hall, be sure to tuck up your robe, wrap it about you, and then pass through the second into the third without stopping. Above all things, have a care that you do not touch the walls, so much as with your clothes. For if you do, you will die instantly. At the end of the third hall, you will find a door which opens into a garden, planted with fine trees, loaded with fruit. Walk directly across the garden to a terrace, where you will see a niche before you, and in that niche, a lighted lamp. Take the lamp down and put it out. When you have thrown away the wick and poured out the liquor, put it in your waistband and bring it to me. Do not be afraid that the liquor will spoil your clothes, for it is not oil, and the lamp will be dry as soon as it is thrown out. After these words, the magician drew a ring off his finger and put it on one of Aladdin's, saying, It is a talisman against all evil, so long as you obey me. Go, therefore, boldly, and we shall both be rich all our lives.'